Thank you, Tom. I've fallen in love with this part of the country. I tell you what, is this thing on? Can you hear? Does that help? Or I can just go like this and you can hear me too, right? That's not even on. Here's what, yeah, that's right. Very good. Uh, here's what I want to do. I know there are a bunch of young uh, writers or uh, uh, writers to be in here. And I'm just going to talk for five or ten minutes about what happened to me until I started writing. Then I'm going to read a little bitty short story. Then I'm going to read an essay or two on writing. That's okay. If anybody has to get up and use the bathroom, that ain't going to offend me. Get up and use the bathroom. I don't want to be known for someone who's got bladder problems. And they, eh, if I hadn't gone to see Singleton, I would have been okay. <laughs> it all starts in Texas. My father was born in Dallas in 1925. He ran away from home in 1941 when his parents divorced. He joined the Merchant Marines out in California when he was 16 years old. Up until this point, he had played high school football on a football team that included Bobby Lane and Doak Walker, who were like Heisman Trophy winners and pro players and stuff. Well, that's what he told me. We don't, I don't see any photographs of this and all that, so that'll be, that's for scholars to figure out. He was in, the, then he got out of the Merchant Marines at 43 or so. He came back. His father had moved to somewhere in Oregon. They, my dad kind of finished high school somehow. He got... Um, accepted to SMU. This is his story. He went three days and he got drafted into World War II, which had kind of been going on, I guess. He scrammed. He was like a Dodger, draft Dodger, but he went back to the West Coast and got on another merchant ship because he had this thing called a Z card, you know, his Coast Guard card. Got on the stupid ship, which got bombed up, you know, all get out by, you know, when it was down in the South Pacific because a lot of merchant ships worked in World War II. When it came back to port in San Francisco, according to my father, the Army was waiting on him and said, do you want to go to Fort Leavenworth, the prison, or go ahead and do your stint in the Army? So he said, I'll do my stint in the Army. He, he got stationed in Beloit, Wisconsin. By this time, my mother from Michigan had gotten a job at Western Union doing whatever they ought to do. My dad, now a corporal, would go and be a courier to Western Union somehow. He met my mom. They got married on January 1st, like kind of white trash people do, 1950, and then they drove down to Dallas and hung out and met his, is anybody here got married on January 1st, sorry, I, sorry, I'm sorry, drove down to Dallas and they drove back west and my father got back in the Merchant Marines and then I was born in 1958. In 1960, he got cancer. They overexposed him to radiation in a hospital in San Francisco, and he had these big red, just scalding, burn maroon marks, color of that fan, all the way through his body. 18 years later, 16 years later, his intestines just kind of split apart from this, you know, how he was compromised by this radiation. But before that, in 1963, he was back. He's cured of the cancer. He's back on a merchant ship. They're in a storm on the West Coast outside of Oregon. He either ended up, this boat ended up either going to either St. Helens or St. Helena, I forget, not the big, you know, volcano thing. They're in a storm. He had to go down to the empty hold of the ship. They're going to get lumber up, up in Washington or whatever, and the ladder broke, and he fell 45 feet into the hold of the ship. 45 feet, you know, four and a half stories, metal. He broke his hips, his back, 57 bones altogether. Took him into the closest port, put him in this little hospital. I was five. Mm, yeah, just turned five. Um, he was in that hospital for a long time. He was a morphine addict because they just started shooting him up with morphine for a long, long time, just saying, this guy's going to die. He wouldn't die. They started doing traction. Over the years, he had a lot of artificial hip operations. On the day he died of lung cancer, even though he never smoked, but he's probably exposed to asbestos in the Merchant Marines. He could walk without limping. But there were a lot of, a lot of um, you know how hip, you all have somebody you know with a hip replacement. They've really gone. I have all my dad's old hip replacements on my desk because they take out one, hand it to us, put in another one, a little bit morbid, but they make good paperweights. <laughs> like big railroad things, railroad spikes. A lot of times I bring them to my school and I say, here, kid, hold this. And go, what is this? I say, my dad's old hip from his body. And they go, ah. you know, I got kind of wimpy, wimpy students. Um, 
Okay, so then that's 63 and 65. Then he got off the morphine, but then he drank a whole lot because he's in pain, pain, pain. Meanwhile, my biological grandfather had moved to South Carolina and somehow started up a small textile supply company. My father's uh, Social Security checks for being disabled were $180 a month. Hard to raise a family on $180 a month even in 1965, right? So his father, my grandfather, said, come on back to South Carolina. I'll let you work at, here at my textile supply company, which makes these things called replacement aprons, but they're just belts that go on spinning frames that yarn runs on so it doesn't snag on metal. I'll pay you under the table. Illegal, but what the heck. My father said, okay. So we moved to South Carolina when I was seven. On the way, we stopped in Dallas, Texas to see dad's mom, his biological mother, Nelta. Nelta, who's by this time been remarried and went by Nelta Sistrunk, played honky-tonk piano in a burlesque kind of operation, owned by Jack Ruby, the man who killed Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who killed Kennedy. <laughs> she was kind of an alcoholic. I, I could mention everybody on my family tree is an alcoholic. That's another story. We got there, it was maybe August, 1st of August, and she said, Little George, because my dad's name was George, never do that to your kid. The Easter Bunny came by here. I was six, you know, six or seven, a little kid, towhead. Easter Bunny came by here and left you something. So she handed me this chocolate Easter Bunny. You've seen that are hollow on the inside. Its head had been eaten off of it. <laughs> and it had turned chalk white, as chocolate it wants to do after a few months after Easter. And, and I was just a little kid, so I'm just standing there, and my dad, who's walking with crutches at this point, wham, he hit me a lot on the back of the hamstrings, saying, like you would go up to a buddy and say, like, hey, Tom, how you doing? My dad said, that's a funny joke, isn't it? Wham, ow, ow. <laughs> so what do you say, thank you, Grandma? So then we moved, to, we moved to South Carolina. So my dad worked for his dad for, let's say, a year or so, and then they had a little bit of a falling out, because dad like me, was hard-headed and said things like, this isn't the right way to do things. So Grandpa fired my father. So my father started up a business, even though he's disabled, so we had to put it in Mom's name. I didn't understand all this stuff at the time because I'm a little kid, you'll see later, worried about other things. So it started up in Mom's name, and then after school, I would have to go to this little textile supply company in case the Social Security cops or whatever showed up. I'm not sure if they ever did or if it's just a paranoia. I know I was scared, so I'm working around these splitting machines that have a 13-foot, 10-inch band blade. If you get your fingers stuck in there, you get cut off fingers easily. They cut leather into little strips if you need them, 50 thousandths thick. You got this thing called a micrometer. So after school, I did a lot of this kind of thing. This isn't like going to be like one of those Charles Dickens stories, I swear. I had a pretty good childhood. <laughs> Grandpa got real mad that Dad started up a business to compete with him, and he tried to kidnap me when I was in the seventh grade. <laughs> So that's one story, and then I wouldn't go out to his car because I knew, because my parents, this is the day before they put little kids' pictures on milk jugs, but we knew, don't go with Grandpa. He's drinking a little too much and he's angry. So I had that fear going on. Then one time, Grandpa showed up and we're playing like, we had this good front yard to play football, so I got my friends over going, 29, 32, hut. hey wait, hold on, time out, time out. Grandpa's got a pistol out of my dad's head and my dad's out there. <laughs> You know, with his cane at this point, angry, and time out, time out. So that kind of got, that kind of uh, scarred me. And then about this time when I was 13, I started running. I started becoming a distance runner. And I started running like this, I bet I can run around the block, which was six-tenths of one mile. And then the next day, I'm going to see if I can run around two of those blocks, which was one mile. And just like Forrest Gump, and I'm not a lot smarter than Forrest Gump, Later, what I'm trying to tell you is anybody can be a writer. I just kept running and running and running. And right before I was 14, I was trying to run the length of a marathon, 26.2 miles, and I ran 20.6. My father, who now had gone, undergone maybe just one or two hip operations, was following me in his VW Bug, putt, 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 which kind of irritates because, A, putt, 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 and I'm trying to concentrate running. Also, he's going four or five miles an hour, and people are blowing the horn and dodging. And it made it a lot more dangerous than it should have been. When I was 14, I was riding a bicycle with my friend, the only Italian in Greenwood, South Carolina, named David Pannone, and I got hit by a car at 55 miles an hour. 
I had something called traumatic brain injury. I was in a coma for a few days, three or four days. I was in the hospital for a long time. I didn't break a bone, but I had blood clots. I still have scars on my elbows and knees and ankle and hip. And I was in pretty bad shape. I don't remember most of the ninth grade. This happened in June of uh, 1972, right about the time Nixon was going, I'm not a crook and all that stuff. <laughs> So that kind of somehow changed my life. I couldn't run for a long time. Then I went back to running, and I was doing really well and went off to this Baptist college. It was actually the best school in South Carolina and still is because the track coach said, man, you, you know, I was running pretty, pretty good stuff, like 10th grade, a 10.22 mile, you know, and like a 4.30 mile in the 10th grade. But I got bored. I got up in the morning at 5, 5.30. I met my friend Philip Snotty, unfortunate last name. <laughs> And we went running forever, you know, and he had this kind of crazy right-wing um, speaking tongues kind of family. So I'm running from dad with his artificial hips handing me and hitting me with a cane, and Philip was running from God or something. <laughs> so that happened. And then I went to college. Well, then my dad got sick and his intestines blew apart, and I had to run his business for quite a while. Um... And then he, miracle, I mean, they said he had a 2% chance of living, and he, he lived through it, and I got to go off to college and quit running. But all of that stuff, especially with the running, gave me some kind of discipline, I think, that you need to be a writer. I get up now, two hours of writing is a heck of a lot easier than an hour in the morning of running. It just is, you know. Okay, now, all of this said, and that was just the highlights. There are a whole lot of these kind of weird stories, but I've uh, not tell them all. And they're all very embarrassing. Um, Flannery O'Connor, the great writer from Milledgeville, Georgia, said, if you can um, make it through your childhood, you got, you know, if you can endure childhood, you got enough to write about. Hey, if that's for me, I'm not here. <laughs> Whose phone is that? Let me talk to him. Okay. Said, if you can uh, endure childhood, you got a lifetime to uh, write about. So, when I turned about 40, I'd publish a bunch already, but I started writing these stories about, hey, I'm going to write a story about a guy looking back who's 30, 40 years old, whatever, looking back at when he was a kid. This is a little short, short story called Segregation. Y'all ready? Real short. Then I'll read an essay and stuff. Then we'll take questions maybe, right? That ain't the story. Hold on a second. It ain't segregation. Hold on a second. Man, I hope it's even in this book. Did I just lie about that? Here it is, here it is, here it is. Sorry about that. I need to mention this, too, about my father. He did this the, the right thing. When we moved to South Carolina, oh, I forgot to tell this story. This is an important part of my life. When we moved to South Carolina, we had not been churchgoers for one reason or another. I don't know. I went to church one time after my father got, fell 45 feet. My mother made us go to church, and I was crying because I'm going, who is this Jesus guy everybody seems to know except for me? But that's another story. When we went to South Carolina, of course, you had to go to church Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday. So we did all that stuff. And then one Wednesday night, it was asked the preacher question, and somebody said, what do we do if a black person, this is 1965, what do we do if a black person comes in our church? And somebody else stood up and said, ignore him and hope he don't come back. And everybody went, ha, 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 ha. They didn't use the word black, by the way. You know, you can imagine. And my father got up on his crutches, I was wearing a seersucker suit, just like Dr. Williams. <laughs> I was looking spectacular. And we started walking out of that church slowly. I mean, just him on those crutches. And uh, yeah, I thought I had done something wrong. I'm getting dragged by the ear. So th this is kind of a seminal point in my growing up, because then my father wouldn't allow me to go to church, because he said, you ain't going to go to church. That's where all those racists hang out every Sunday, and blah, blah, blah. So I, even when I had like a nice Catholic girlfriend, and say, Vivian wants me to go do that knee thing a lot on Christmas Eve or whatever that's all about, and he go, no, you cannot go. If you go, move out of the house. So that's wrong. And then when I went to the Baptist school, man, he was not happy about that, I'll tell you that. <laughs> My father also made me, he drove around and had me meet people from, uh, we were like lower middle class, upper lower class, but we, he had a lot of African-American friends and kind of poor, what I call lint heads, where I'm from, cotton mill worker friends. Uh, one, this is just a quick story. One time my father said, out of nowhere, I think you should have a pet rabbit. 
I went, I, what? I don't know. I want a dog. Dog, Dad, dog. I don't want a rat. No, you need to have a pet rabbit. So he got in the car, and because of these hip things, he kind of drove a car like, because he couldn't hold his thing. So we went to this place where this man sold rabbits, and he had one arm. It was a one-armed, rabbit-selling man. He didn't have a right arm. So my get out of the car, and there's these rabbits. Mine ended up being named Snowball. And my dad said, shake hands, you know, with Mr. Williams. So I stick out my right hand, and Mr. Williams does that little Bob Dole kind of handshake, you know, where he turns his hand around backwards. And I, because I'm going, whoa, yeah, he doesn't have a right hand. And, we, and then my dad, on the way back to the car, while I'm holding this stupid rabbit with pink eyes, it kind of scared me a little bit. A lamb with his, you know, crutch. He goes, you got to pay attention, boy. You got to pay attention. So that's kind of it. Now I'll read this story. This is the dirtiest story ever. This has the worst word imaginable. It's never mentioned, so it's going to be y'all's dirty minds that conjure this word up. Do y'all know that thing called the name game? Like if you said Tim, Tim, Bobim, Banana, Fana, Fo, Fim. You remember that thing? Okay, that's all you need to know. My second grade teacher, it's called unemployment. My second grade teacher didn't think ahead when she agreed to let us use... I'm starting over. My second grade teacher didn't think ahead when she agreed to let us sing that name game song the last hour of Valentine's Day class because, as Miss Dupree even admitted, her homemade heart-shaped cookies turned out warped into looking more like bananas. It seemed almost necessary to sing. My friend Compton Lane had suggested everything, seeing as we no longer took music classes weekly. The chorus teacher had quit during Christmas break saying that she couldn't distinguish an on-key student in all of 45 elementary. I didn't quite understand the implications of Compton's request, didn't realize what lyrics would occur in a class that, oddly, included two Chucks, a boy named Lucky, another named Tucker, and an unfortunate girl, unless later on in life she had gathered work in a Nevada brothel, whose parents tabbed her Bucky. Okay, Miss Dupree said. We'll sing the song starting with Compton. Then, Comp, you point to whoever's next. She went on to say how we would hand out our cheap Valentine's cards to each other, af other afterwards and eat her misbaked cookies that, once she realized hadn't come out heart-shaped, were iced yellow with Happy Valentine's Day painted in red. As years went on, I remember those cookies as reading only Happy VD. <laughs> But maybe, maybe my memory turns that way because, maybe my memory turns that way because 23-year-old Miss Dupree had gotten fired soon after handing them out. <coughs> the class stood in a circle, surrounded by four corkboards that stressed personal hygiene, poisonous plants, things to do on rainy days, and how to crouch during both natural and unnatural disasters. Compton pointed at me when his name was done only because we were best friends and both had crazy runaway mothers. We went Mendel, Mendel, Bobendel, Banana, Fana, Fofendel, etc. And the whole time, Comp jerked his head for me to call on Tucker. I pointed toward Tucker next, not knowing this was second grade in a town where people gossiped when someone said darn or heck fire after falling from a roof. That our song would have a term I had heard only once when my father stepped on a nail. Miss Dupree didn't even know the bad word, at least from the expression on her face. Later on, I figured that she'd been trained thusly in her education courses in some class like psychology of pranksters or whatever. Tucker pointed at one of the Chucks, Chuck pointed at the other, and then that Chuck chose Bucky in succession. From down the second grade hallway, I'm sure it sounded like a shipload of merchant marines <clears throat> were holding a sing-along. I do that water. I know this because our principal, a stern, unamused man named Mr. Aldrich, happened to be taking a group of state legislators <laughs> on a tour of 45 Elementary at the time, hopeful that we'd get more funding to at least re-roof the place so there wouldn't be doves nesting in every classroom ceiling and attracting hunters during season which subsequently made it difficult to comprehend Miss Dupree 
over the shotgun blast. <laughs> Mr. Aldrich motioned for us to stop and then took our teacher outside the door. I made out, see me in my office after school, and then Miss Dupree said, my cookies came out funny. I didn't take any home ec classes in a South Carolina state-supported college. Compton held his shoulders almost to his ears and his eyebrows toward the dove's nest. Glenn Flack said, I heard my daddy say those bad words one time to my mom. Miss Dupree walked back in slower than she normally moved. Her red and white polka dot skirt didn't swish. I think we're going to have... I think we're going to have to stop now, class. I think y'all did a wonderful job. <laughs> but Mr. Aldrich says it's very important that we have no fun until 3 o'clock. <laughs> it's officially quiet time. Y'all can pass out your cards to one another and come get two each of my cookies. But we can't make noise. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I didn't know at the time that presently we would have a new teacher who would start each day singing a hymn, that Miss Dupree would quit and never teach again. But I swear I studied her face and noticed the same thing I would later see on my own wife's face and on the faces of both men and women in a textile town gone bust during the Reagan and Bush administrations. I'm sorry, that's what happened to cotton mills in the South during that time. We tiptoed across our linoleum floor and handed out those be mine I'm all yours and your special non-folding card. Y'all know what I'm talking about, those little cheap things? Shirley Ebo, the only black girl stuck in an otherwise non-integrated school, gave me a card that must have been a reject or a second. Instead of, let's be friends, it read only, let's fend. She hadn't signed it. I said, thanks, Shirley Ebo. She said, does your name, mean, does your name stand for something else, Mendel? Is it short for something? I said, I don't know, men, doll, I doubt it. Compton came over and said, my mom says my name means free, but she didn't want to name me that. Comp was my best friend from birth onward. In college, she would tell women that his name was short for a complimentary, compulsive, compatible, and complex. <laughs> Shirley Ebo said, my last name means, means something in Africa. I'm a warrior. I said, uh-huh, and took more cards from my classmates. Miss Dupree sat at her desk, opened the drawer, and stared down. I had completely forgotten to sign a card for her and had no other choice but to approach the desk and hand Miss Dupree what Shirley Ebo had given to me earlier. Let's fend, my teacher <laughs> said aloud. That's funny, Mendel. Let's fend. I agree with that. And then she stood up, walked around her desk, took my face in her young hands, and kissed me on the forehead. When she hugged me, the side of my face wedged directly into her cleavage. My classmates let out an ooh <laughs> in a way none of us could perform in music class. <laughs> I blushed, almost cried, and then the bell rang. On my way out of school that day, I passed Mr. Aldrich's office. <clears throat> my teacher sat across from him, her face turned away. I stood there and watched the principal wave his arms. Then he leaned back in his chair and spread his feet on the desk. Miss Dupree stood up, pointed at him, then looked at me standing by the door. Years later, I would say that she blew a kiss, mouth, thank you, and waved to me in a manner that meant for me to get away and keep going. Okay, there's that. Okay, some of y'all probably want to know how to make a million dollars writing stories. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how to make a million dollars. <coughs> it is a little bit warm in here. No, I'm fine. No, 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 no. I'd be just distracting. I get off. I can't do two things at one time. S stop it, Jeffrey. But that is the nicest thing a dean's ever done for me. <laughs> I usually just run. Okay, here's a little essay called, this is nonfiction, maybe. How to write stories, lose weight, clean up the environment, and make one million dollars. 
This plan will work if and only if the writer to be is, say, 25 years old and intends to live another 50 years. But it's fun to play even if you start at age 30 or 40. Maybe it'll give you the incentive to live past 90. Day one. Wake up early and sit in front of the computer or open up a nice Mead composition notebook. It doesn't matter. I will assume that you know what a short story is. Basically a 5,000 word piece of fiction with a recognizable beginning, middle, and end that involves a protagonist trying to best an antagonist. There will be rising action, conflict, dialogue, and maybe even a beautiful lyrical passage shoved somewhere in the middle when you weren't quite sure where the story was headed. On the first day, put two characters in an uncomfortable situation. Maybe you're writing about the time you were 16 years old and buying condoms and your boyfriend or girlfriend's mother walked up behind you. <laughs> That's pretty awkward if you ask me. This is fiction though, so you need to make up some crap. <clears throat> make the mother limp too, for instance. Have her holding a package of bunion pads. Anyway, write a thousand words on that first day. Now go out. This will work if and only if you live out in the country in a state that doesn't offer a nickel for cans, seeing as no one in those states throws nickels out of the open car truck windows, I doubt, like they do where I live in Dacusville, South Carolina. Go out with a plastic bag and pick up at least 50 aluminum cans. This might take as much as one quarter mile of walking. Come back home and place the cans upright. Stomp on them. This will reduce space. Throw the cans in some kind of container with a top, a rubber garbage can, for instance. If you live in an apartment complex, make sure that your neighbors don't snoop around and steal your cans. Wait, you live in the country. You live in a place like Dacusville, South Carolina. Maybe I should have mentioned that you might be living in a trailer. Anyway, put up the cans. Start thinking about tomorrow. Day two. Reread your first 1,000 words. Rewrite. If you chose to write in a notebook, type up the rewrite on a computer. I'm not going to mention this again. Make sure your character's names didn't change somewhere in the middle. Pick right up where you left off and add another 1,000 words. Mm -hmm. Then go out and gather another 50 cans, which might take you as much as a half mile of walking. Stomp. Add to the first batch. Day three. Reread your first 2,000 words. Rewrite. Write another 1,000. Go out and walk and retrieve 50 cans, which might take three quarters of a mile. Don't forget to wash your hands when you get home. I should have mentioned that earlier, too. Stomp and add to the first two days batch. Day four. Reread your first 3,000 words. Rewrite. Write another 1,000 words. Go walk a mile and pick up 50 cans. Stomp them when you get home. Make a note to change the antagonist's name in your story because you don't want to get sued later on in life by people who don't have the tenacity to become famous, rich, skinny, and environmentally conscious in the old-fashioned, difficult way. Add your cans into the bin and realize that you've picked up 200 aluminum cans already. Good job. You're doing your part. If you want to celebrate, make sure to drink a beer out of a can so you can add it to your collection. <laughs> Day five. Reread your 4,000 words, rewrite, write another 1,000 words, finish up that first draft of your story. You've probably been thinking of possible titles while taking your aluminum can gathering walks, so make a decision. First off, ditch the first two or three titles that came into your mind. One of them will probably be something like The Lesson. It's been used. One of them might be Good Country People, seeing as you're happy about good country people throwing out their empty PBR cans. You can't use that title either. <coughs> so settle on something like Captain of the Solitaire Team because you've been thinking about how all those homeschool kids live in the area don't have sports teams or after school activities. Okay, now go out, walk a good mile and a quarter down the two lane road and get your 50 cans. Bring them home, stomp on them and add to the rest. Day six, reread the finished story, make some changes print out a few copies, go out and get another 50 cans, which might take you a mile and a half of walking. When you get home, stand on the scale and notice that all this walking has caused you to lose almost four ounces of weight. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have been eating all those Little Debbie's oatmeal cream pies while you wrote. Now gather your cans and take them down to a place that buys scrap metal. Turn in the cans. I wrote this only about a year or two ago, and uh, the cost of aluminum's go plummeted. On average, 25 cans weigh about a pound. 
you'll turn in 10 pounds of aluminum cans, which will come to about $5 on today's market. Use that money to buy stamps. Buy six first class mail stamps. Buy six first class mail stamps and as many subsequent ounce stamps as possible. I realize that postal rates will go up in the future, but then again, maybe the price of recyclable aluminum will skyrocket. Always be optimistic, like I am. A 5,000 word story usually runs 18 pages. Every four pages of typing paper weighs an ounce. Your story, plus the cover letter, which will only read, Dear Editors, please consider the enclosed story, Captain of the Solitaire Team, for an upcoming issue, will cost less than a buck fifty to mail. And you'll need a regular business size SASE enclosed for response. So that's, say, $1.91 tops. You'll almost be able to send your story out to three places, which, for some reason, is frowned upon by some editors. But what the hell? You wouldn't apply for one job at a time, would you? And the editors are way up in New York, more than likely, and so won't send, and so won't send down their unpaid interns to rough you up, because the unpaid interns would stay for good once they notice how you live in one of the cleanest square miles in America. <laughs> A dollar and 91 cents times three comes to five dollars and 73 cents. <coughs> Maybe you should have picked up more than 50 cans a day. I should have mentioned that it's easy to find empty aluminum cans in the garbage cans at convenience stores, gas stations, in most parking lots, and so on. Maybe you understood that already. I hope so. I'm hopeful that you got obsessed about picking up aluminum and that you have enough for extra stamps. I know what happened to me. When people ask me, rudely, I think, about my retirement plans, I say that I have all my money wrapped up in the aluminum market. <laughs> now send out your story to the New Yorker, Harper's, the Atlantic Monthly, Playboy, Esquire, any of those slick magazines that pay upwards of $3,000 a story. The chances of two of those magazines wanting the same story are slim. Don't sweat over it like I am. If you do sweat over it, just think of it as another way to lose weight. <laughs> Day seven, start over. Start a new story. Write a thousand words. Go out and pick up cans. Notice how you're now walking farther or further. Make a note to get out the dictionary and look up the difference between those two words <laughs> when you get home, stomp, and wash your hands. Do the same for lay and lie so you no longer have to write sentences like, I reclined on the couch, or <laughs> you're telling a big fat untruth. Day eight. Don't be discouraged by the rejection from the Atlantic Monthly. It'll appear that the fiction editor rented a Learjet to give you the bad news. How did the post office get the manuscript to him and he get the answer back so quickly, you'll wonder. He's that fast. Rewrite the first thousand words of the second story, write another thousand, realize that you need to get the first story back out in the mail soon. You might have to jack up the number of cans per day for you'll need more postage. End of year two. You finally hear about that first story you sent off from those magazines that were not the Atlantic Monthly. Because you've sent a story a week to them, you think, man, the New Yorker's still holding 103 stories of mine. <laughs> Meanwhile, you've taken each story and sent it off to literary journals that pay 50 bucks a page or 25 or 10. You'll start sending to places that offer you contributors copies. But that's all right. <clears throat> You're up to walking anywhere from 6 to 10 miles a day in order to find cans. <laughs> You've lost 20 pounds or more. <coughs> Year eight. The Atlantic Monthly takes a story, or Harper's, no matter what or where. You get three to 5,000 bucks upon signing the contract. Do not go out on a 15-year drinking binge. <laughs> Promise me you will not go out on a 15-year drinking binge. <clears throat> Take the money and invest it in either a CD, getting 5% interest, or in a mutual fund that is not Putnam Voyager B. <laughs> Years 9 through 15. You've sold stories now to a few of the slick magazines. You've told a number of agents that you were thinking about writing a novel. You've been anthologized, and you've been in a number of literary magazines. <clears throat> you still live in a trailer, but the countryside is spectacular. <laughs> you've invested all that money and now can boast about being a $25,000 heir. Years 16 through 19, surely someone will take a chance on publishing your first collection of stories. You've now written about 832 of the things, <laughs> 10 of which are okay. <laughs> Year 20, 
Sign the book deal no matter what. Like the rest of your money, stash 90% of the picky unit advance into a CD or mutual fund. That is not Putnam Voyager B. Take what's left over to wash and wax your trailer. After 20 years, you'll never understand the workings of interest rates, but over time, notice how you don't have kids with which to bother or a spouse, seeing as you've been slightly focused on your work, your savings will grow and grow and grow. You'll get more book deals and a chance to leave the trailer in order to speak to people at colleges. They'll pay you more money than the magazine somehow. And you'll speak at writers' conferences, even though you never attended one over all those years. <laughs> you never attended because, one, they cost way too much money, and two, you rightly wrote over that time instead of talked about writing. Caveats. This little outline, of course, must be adjusted if you have a full-time job on the side. <clears throat> Maybe you have medical problems that need to be looked into. Maybe you live in a dry county where there's not enough discarded beer cans. Maybe you live in a county with a high rate of diabetes and there aren't Coke or Pepsi products laying or lying around. Maybe it's difficult to write a story a week. One every month is fine, but you'll have to multiply all those years up above by four. Maybe the trailer gets hit by a tornado and you lose the will to live. Maybe you went on that 15-year drinking binge, like I've heard most writers do. <laughs> Maybe you fell in love with someone coming from the other direction, picking up cans off the side of the road. And now there's a bad, jealous rivalry going on between two writers. Well, then, don't write. All right. That's about it. I'm good. Shoot. What do I do now? We got a few minutes to take a yeah. We'll take a few questions. I had bad um in case I scare anybody later, it looks like I have leprosy, but it's just um it's poison ivy that I got real bad and then it's finally it's all dead now, but it looks like I have leprosy. So. <laughs> I look like that. What was that great movie with Dustin Hoffman and Steve McQueen and their Papillon and they go to the leper colony and that guy's smoking the cigar? That's kind of what my hands look like. I'm just kidding. I really do have lepers. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> <laughs> everybody runs. Yes, yes. Yeah. I didn't write that crap. <laughs> I mean, that's a publisher who writes that kind of crap. Okay. Well, I saw you have that degree in philosophy, so do you try and put those philosophical ideas into your story in any way? I try not. I mean, I try not to, and here's why. I mean, it's gonna, it's inescapable that y'all don't like. No one likes to be lectured to, and a lot of times, if you're trying to be overly uh, symbolic or overly um, uh, uh, philosophical. The reader goes, oh, shut up. Who You ain't that smart. You're from South Carolina, boy. You know? <laughs> but I can't escape it. I mean, I studied all that philosophy, and I still read it occasionally and go, well, what's this mean? And, um, and it's just my, you know, if you said, quote some Spinoza, quote some Leibniz, I couldn't do it. But if I read it, I probably would. And I know that all those, those four years of studying philosophy and reading some after just kind of seeped in and... and and the guys that I like, Wittgenstein and, and then Schopenhauer, I mean, Schopenhauer was just this madman. And even the old guys like Diogenes, I mean, I like the real skeptic, mean, you know, Diogenes walking around with a thing with a lit lantern in the daylight saying, I'm looking for an honest man or getting a, who was it? He, he asked the, you know, like the king or what, whatever, Peter, was it Peter the Great or somebody? He goes, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. Well, what do you want? Well, just stand there so you block the sun. Give me a little shade. I mean, he was like nuts, you know. <laughs> Schopenhauer went around with this gold coin, and he would go to an English pub for lunch every day and put this big gold coin out and eat and then put the gold coin back in his pocket and pay for his meal and leave. And finally, the guy says, why are you doing that? And it's an English pub, and he says, I'm waiting for a day when I think English people have a good conversation, an intelligent conversation, and then I'm going to give it to them. And I've never heard them have. You know, he's just mean. All right. Does that help? Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> the, the, the 
comedian, actor, director, Steve Martin was a philosophy major. He kind of says the same stuff. He says, you know, I can't, I studied it all, I was very interested in it, but it just kind of it made me view, it's, what I'd say is it's, it makes me, it caused me to view the world in the way I do, which is, this is screwy, you know. <laughs> Probably. I mean, I never really thought about it, but I think it's pretty, you know, I went to the dean's office and I was talking about Wittgenstein. He goes, hey, look at this cool book of the original manuscript. And I'm reading all this stuff by Wittgenstein. He's like, the world is all that is the case. I said, hey, Dr. Williams, come here. I want to read you some stuff. The world is made up of facts, not things. And he went, oh, uh, what does that even mean? You know, what we cannot speak of, we must pass over in silence. Now, this is goofy. You know, that's goofy. It's just absurd. You know, okay, then we can't speak anything, so we all better shut up, as opposed to just talking nonstop like I am, you know. Shooting birdshot, hoping to say something smart. Yeah, I think it's kind of funny. You know, yeah, life is kind of funny. I'm from South Carolina. You heard about my governor lately? <laughs> that's funny. You know, and it all goes back. I mean, what I, what I live off of is... You're welcome, by the way. <laughs> you know, you know, y'all are going around saying, "That gum, our governor keeps talking about secession," but that governor's an idiot. You know. <laughs> oh, this is on tape, isn't it? Gee, I went to college with our governor. He's an idiot. But anyway, um, uh, 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 what was I going to say? I was going to say something about comedy, philosophy. Okay, so this all goes back. Samuel Beckett, the great Irish playwright, said there's, uh, there's nothing funnier than human misery. And it's like, we're wa that sounds mean, but it's kind of true. If we're watching uh, Three Stooges, which only men seem to think is really funny, and women just kind of put up with it, I think. But if I see Larry hit Mo with the frying pan, and then Curly's doing that stuff, I go, that's funny, because it ain't happening to me. And then that goes all the way back to Aristotle and his notion of catharsis, you know, Oedipus stabbing his eyeball out. He goes, man, my life stinks, but at least I'm not sleeping with my mama and stabbing my eyeball out, you know. And that's all, you know, comedy, so. Except in South Carolina where we do that all the time. That's kind of a rule. Turn 18, you can do all that. Okay, next question. So what's going to happen to your governor? Have you seen our lieutenant governor? Let me tell you about him. First of all, his name is Andre. My old publisher's name was Andre, so I know men named Andre, but there aren't a whole lot of men named Andre in South Carolina. And he looks like Eddie Munster. He's got that thing. And he's caught, been caught two or three times driving like 105, 95 miles an hour not on official business, right? He crashed an airplane. He's flying this airplane. He's drunk out of his mind, I'm pretty sure. He crashed it near the North Carolina, South Carolina border. Ooh, they call up the 911. He's got a buddy with him. They get him in an ambulance, and he's kind of hurt, and, they, and he, we're going to go to this close. Well, I don't know. Drive on to the neck. Keep driving. So they drive like 50 miles to Spartanburg, where he's got a buddy from college who's working at that hospital. So maybe some truth won't come out, and I just don't. And there are no, you know, I'm dying the wool Democrat. I've been that way. My dad made me be that way. That's just how I am. But there ain't no good Democrats inside. I mean, if, if they're sane, they're sane enough not to run, you know. <laughs> so who knows? I, don't, I think that guy isn't going to quit, though. Who knows? I don't care. I've, i got to quit. I was telling... Dr. Hudson, before all this crap with Argentina and our governor, I dislike this guy so much because the pen is mightier than the sword, or as in South Carolina they say the pen is mightier than the sword. <laughs> I would always have a little simple-minded guy. You ever see that movie uh, Tropic Thunder and there's Simple Jack the movie? If I had a little character like that in every story, just make a minor appearance, but his name was Little Simple Marco Sanford, named after my governor. I can't use that anymore because it looks that's too easy, you know? It was my little joke back then, but now everybody go, well, that's too easy, you know, the guy's in enough trouble, and, you know, I, it was love at first sight, you know, whatever. <laughs> Amoro. Uh, one more. 
One more. I, sw I swear it'll be a, I won't answer for a long time. Dr. Hudson. Oh, my, mine wouldn't be on there. <laughs> uh, Flannery O'Connor complete stories. I read, I did everything wrong in college. They said read the classics, and I wouldn't. I was hard headed, so I read Thomas Pynchon, Sam Beckett, Eugenie Inesco, these playwrights, Donald Barthelme, who taught at Houston for, lived in Houston for a number of years, got to John Barth. I think it's good to know all that Faulkner. I think it's really good to know William Faulkner, especially if you're going to be on Jeopardy one day. <laughs> But if you wrote like William Faulkner, I don't think you'd get published today, unfortunately. You know, I just wouldn't. Those are great books. Absalom, Absalom, Sound of the Fury, all that. For short stories, which I would rather read and write, I would go with Flannery O'Connor. I'd go with John Cheever, although I don't care about rich people. But man, he is a craftsperson. He's great. And Raymond Carver, probably. Yeah, probably. All right, that it? That's it. I'm going to quit sweating now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.